Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Shuttered Pharmacies, a Major Hole in Healthcare. Today's event is co-hosted by the Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics, the Price School of Public Policy, and the Mann School of Pharmacy, all at the University of Southern California. My name is Karen Van Nuys. I'm a senior fellow at the Schaefer Center, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. From administering vaccines to prescribing contraceptives and dispensing naloxone for the prevention of fatal overdoses, pharmacies play a vital frontline role in community well being. Yet, nearly one in four U.S. neighborhoods lack convenient access to, to pharmacies, and hundreds of pharmacies close their door every year. Furthermore, pharmacy deserts contribute to persistent racial and ethnic health, health disparities. Today's discussion will explore these trends, what is driving them, and what can be done about them. We will begin with a panel conversation among our distinguished lineup of speakers, followed by audience Q&A. So please get your questions ready and submit them anytime using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. We are honored to have three terrific panelists today who can each speak to different elements of the problem and potential solutions. First, we have Representative Diana Harshbarger. A native of East Tennessee, Congresswoman Harshbarger is a former business owner and community pharmacist. She is currently serving her second term in the U.S. House of Representatives and sits on the House Committee on Energy and Commerce and its Health Subcommittee. Representative Harshbarger is a member of the Republican Donor Doctors Caucus, the Bipartisan Addiction and Mental Health Task Force, and the House Rural Health Care Coalition, and the Congressional Telehealth Caucus. Welcome, Representative Harshbarger. Next, we have Dr. Ronna Hauser. Dr. Hauser is a pharmacist and the Senior Vice President of Policy and Pharmacy Affairs for the National Community Pharmacists Association. In that role, Dr. Hauser is responsible for NCPA's professional affairs public policy and regulatory initiatives. She represents and presents on behalf of NCPA at governmental and private sector meetings and is NCPA's lead for relationships and outreach to federal agencies such as CMS and the FDA. Welcome, Dr. Hauser. And finally, we have Dr. Dima Katu. Dr. Katu is the Hygieia Centennial Chair and Associate Professor in the Alfred Mann School of Pharmacy at USC and a senior fellow at the Schaefer Center. Dr. Katu is a pharmacist and has been leading research on pharmacy deserts, closures, and their impact on disparities in access to medicines for more than 10 years. Her research and advocacy work have been funded by the National Institutes of Health and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Her work has been published in leading health policy and medical journals and has informed federal and state policy. Welcome, Dr. Katu. Let's begin the conversation with you. Can you start by giving us a broad overview based on your research summarizing the pharmacy landscape in the US and how it's been changing over the last 10 or so years? Yeah, sure. So um, I think when people think about pharmacies at least 10 years ago, you know, it was always like, oh, pharmacies are everywhere. You know, every neighborhood has their corner drugstore, they're growing and there's no access barriers. But what we found probably more than eight years ago now is that there's pharmacy deserts. So even though the number of pharmacies has increased, um, at least prior to 2015, there are neighborhoods that lack access. And what we've what we know that has happened since you know the last several years, especially, is that the number of pharmacies has the number of pharmacies closing has increased. Right. So the total number of pharmacies serving American communities in aggregate has declined. You know, when you compare today from like let's say 10 years ago. Uh, so, so that's kind of just the availability of pharmacies. There are fewer pharmacies now than there were a decade ago. That's one. And two, uh, it's just the landscape around networks, what pharmacies you can go to, which ones you can't, how, how pharmacies are being paid. And all of that impacts access. So it's not just a pharmacy being available. It's even if, if it is, can you use it? So these pharmacy networks and contract arrangements between payers um, and health plans uh, and pharmacies has grown and it impacts pharmacy access. And I think last and most importantly is the scope of pharmacy services and how they've expanded. And we saw that, you know, during COVID, but, you know, it started before COVID, but it became critical during COVID, um, you know, in terms of just prescribe, going beyond just prescribing, dispensing medications to prescribing them and providing 
uh, preventive and emergency services. Thanks. That seems uh, those trends sound like a wake up call uh, for, um, for our conversation today. Um, next, for Dr. Hauser, from the community pharmacy perspective, what is driving those trends and are there particular practices that are leading uh, to pharmacy deserts? Sure, absolutely. It's an unfortunate story we see about um, all too often. I actually saw a, a colleague of mine um, post on LinkedIn, I think I just saw it this morning, that yet another independent pharmacy closed this time in Pennsylvania after 70 years of business. And the owners said the simple fact was their finances. And the third party payments they were receiving to dispense prescriptions just simply weren't covering their finances to run their business. And we see this story all too often. And to Dima's point, um, it's where a lot of these pharmacies are closing that we're very concerned about um, because access to care is, is definitely being impeded. So what factors are we seeing? Uh, we're seeing several, but um, our members in general derive 50% uh, of their business, over 50% of their prescription volume comes from federal payers such as Medicare and Medicaid and the rest being uh, third party, uh, you know, commercial non-government payers, and then some uh, small amount of cash pay based there. But vertical integration in the industry, uh, vertical healthcare integration has absolutely led to the decline that we're seeing. Uh, we now have large insurance companies um, tied up with pharmacy benefit managers and pharmacy benefit managers or PBMs is who pay our members. So PBM uh, checks keep pharmacies either open or uh, unfortunately checks that are uh, below cost, you know, close pharmacies. So uh, we've seen vertical integration uh, lead to the demise here of, of uh, many of our members, unfortunately. And that's because um, there's intense pressure uh, from these pharmacy benefit managers because they own their own pharmacies or they are affiliated with certain pharmacies to steer patients to those pharmacies in which they have an interest in. So we see uh, patient steering practices um, leading to patients, you know, unfortunately not being able to frequent their local community pharmacy anymore. Um, we see below cost reimbursement, which I've mentioned. Uh, it costs a pharmacy a certain amount to acquire the drug, and then it costs them a certain amount to dispense the drug. And when your uh, overall reimbursement is less than those two numbers added together, you know, below cost underwater reimbursements won't keep your lights on. And uh, restricted and preferred networks is another thing. Beyond the steering, uh, the steering is done in the name of saving money. So you'll get a lower copay at a pharmacy that's affiliated with the insurance company. Um, you know, or these very large preferred networks are set up in Medicare Part D. And many times those terms to be a participant in those networks aren't even offered to independent pharmacies. So, you know, we have several factors at play. Those are the ones I'd say that predominantly um, are leading to uh, these closures that we see. And, and we encourage our members every day to increase their non-dispense, um, you know, increase their non-dispensing revenue by, um, you know, growing the services they're offering to their communities. But, um, you know, that does take time. And uh, that dispensing revenue is still a key portion of a community pharmacy's bottom line. Thanks. I uh, I hope we get to pick up on the the pharmacy benefit manager points in a minute. But I want to get the um, the legislation, the the regulatory trends in here as well. So, Representative Harshbarger, what federal legislative or regulatory ideas are policymakers considering to address pharmacy shortage areas? Well, um, you know. We are a very, probably the most trusted profession out there. And, you know, I make the joke that I went from the most trusted profession to the least trusted profession, <laughs> going from pharmacy to politics. But you know why I did that? Uh, it's the very reason. You cannot fix a problem if you don't understand it. And like Rana said, you know, I've been uh, a pharmacy owner for over, you know, 37 years. I've worked every uh, portion. I've been retail hospital. I've done home health hospice. There's nothing I haven't done except nuclear when it comes to the profession of pharmacy. And over 25 years, I have gone to Congress and talked to my congressmen and my senators about the crushing overregulation that we're seeing uh, in the in the whole realm of pharmacy. As as Rhonda spoke about the, uh, you know, I, I represent a rural district. And when those pharmacies close, most people live within five miles from a pharmacy and they don't have to have an appointment. They walk in, they have access to us and we're there to answer their questions. And really it's a triage. You know, we tell them where to go based on what their needs are. And many times these people only have access to a pharmacist. And so when I ran for Congress, I thought I've been talking about this for 25 years. It's time just to raise my hand and say, pick me so I can get some things done. And believe me, we are doing it. And we have bipartisan support for PBM reform. 
right now the FTC is looking at the business practices of pharmacy benefit managers and the vertical integration that's gone on for years. The FTC should have stopped that years ago. There are transparent PBMs and, you know, even in California right now, I, I, I'm talking about places like Ventegra, some of the uh, transparent pharmacy benefit managers who let you know what they're going to charge on the front end. You know, it's it's a pay to play scheme. And we've had oversight hearings about this. And the last time we spoke to the FTC to see where they were in the sequencing of, of getting information from pharmacy benefit managers, this is the statement we got back. They have never had so much pushback since the inception of the FTC as they have from pharmacy benefit managers answering and turning over information to be assessed by the, the FTC. Now, that statement in itself is something that tells them, I just smiled, myself and Buddy Car Carter, who is the other pharmacist in Congress, I said, welcome to our world for the last 25 years, and we can't get information either. That's why you see the closure of these precious independent pharmacies who may be the only source of uh, health care that these people get or the only way to get their questions answered. And it's a travesty. And we it's not just on the House side, it's on the Senate side. And we have bipartisan support to reform these uh, pharmacy benefit managers. So to pick up on this idea of transparent PBMs and the difficulty of getting information, not just for the FTC uh, investigation, but also for pharmacies, is yeah. transparent, do you see transparency as kind of the centerpiece of fixing these problems or is there more to it? Well, of course, who doesn't know? You, several years ago, you wouldn't know what DIR fees were and or clawbacks, you don't know what that is. Now everybody understands what the definition is of DIR fees. When you talk to, and I've talked to independent pharmacies all over the country, I'm sure like Ronna does. And when you get uh, some people who may own 15 pharmacies, if they get millions of dollars in clawbacks, how can you even set a budget from month to month when you don't know what the, they're going to take back after the point of sale, after that has already been established, then they decide, well, we didn't get enough. So we're going to come back and take more. That is, uh, it's incredulous that they would even do that. But what we can, you know, the transparency comes in, where does that money go that they take back? You know, it's uh, it's a shell game. So what we're trying to do is, uh, in oversight, get answers and reform the system. It's like I tell my colleagues, we don't want to put a silver bullet and kill them. We just want to really mortally wound them in a way to where they straighten up and say, look, this is how we need to do this. And we're going to allow you to do business, but you've got to tell us the truth and be very transparent in the way you do business. You raise a great point. I want to, I want to, drill into the, um, the, the reimbursement model or the payment model a little bit more, Dr. Hauser. Um, can you explain the pharmacy payment model briefly? We've talked a little bit about DIR fees, underwater reimbursement and so on. Um, but then following up, if there are changes to the current pharmacy payment model that you would, uh, that would help address the, the pharmacy shortage issue? Sure. So changing the pharmacy payment model is one of NCPA's uh, number one priorities. And everything we do federally and at the state level is to reform that payment model. So again, our members can keep their doors open and serve their patients. So I mentioned it earlier, the cost to dispense a prescription are twofold, the cost to acquire the drug and the cost to dispense the drug. So uh, we do have some models out there that follow that logic. So for example, in Medicaid fee for service, our members are paid, I know a cost plus type of arrangement where you're paid the cost it, you know, that you pay to acquire it plus the cost to dispense it. And those are based on uh, studies, the cost of dispenses. So, um, you know, we do have models out there that work. It's just, we need to expand them. And, you know, you've heard of a lot of activity recently in the pharmacy prescription drug benefit world. You've heard a lot of disruptors, you know, coming in to shake things up, which we think is very positive. Uh, transparent PBMs, you know, entities that are really trying to peel back the layers on the onion and show what's really happening to Congresswoman Harshbarger's point. Uh, we've got to know what's happening to fix it. So uh, we're pleased with the disruption. We want to see it continue. We want to see everyone play fair. And, uh, you know, playing fair is not DIR fees to the tune of it's $12.6 billion, billion dollars in DIR fees. And that was in 2021. So that's a government statistic number provided by the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission. But that was for 2021. They are growing rapidly. And our members cannot afford to stay in business when they're paying fees 
to the tunes of millions and billions of dollars to PBMs to fill Part D prescriptions. So we've got to stop these practices and, and pay pharmacists what it costs to actually uh, provide the care to their patients. Uh, Representative Harshbarger, back to you. Uh, there is a bipartisan bill in Congress now, um, the Equitable Community Access to Pharmacy S Pharmacist Services Act, H.R. 1770. I know you support it. Um, and that would change parts of the pharmacy reimbursement model. Can you talk a little bit about that legislation and how it could help here? Well, it, it's almost like a skinny version of provider status. You know, we pharmacists, you saw how uh, well received we became during the, the pandemic. And with uh, and they wondered, how did West Virginia do so well in vaccinating people? Well, look at your independent pharmacies. That's where it started. You know, you have a relationship with those pharmacists and we can step in and take the burden off the healthcare system, basically, we don't have enough nurses. We do not have enough uh, physicians. So let us do what we're best at doing, and that's provide the care. And like I told you before, let us provide that triage. We know when somebody needs care that we can't give them, and, and let us be. Let us have that provider status. But you know what? We've given away so many things during the years. You know how many times have I helped someone because I'm a compounding pharmacist as well giving them their medication or, or taking care of them without reimbursement, giving away things at free advice. And, and that's what we do. We are required to talk to them and tell them how to use their medication. But why don't you pay us what we're worth? Is what I was, all we're saying. I mean, we can be a valuable part of the healthcare team when it comes to reimbursement, even with uh, Medicare Part B. There's actually a question in the chat from one of our listeners that I think relates here. Um, so is there consideration for a differential for quality pharmacy care versus mass volume pharmacy? Um, and typically poor quality with little, little or no patient care service affecting pharmacy service, pharmacy deserts um, and how that differs from the kind of care you're talking about, uh, Representative Harshbarger. Well, there's, you know, it's it's kind of like the uh, Medicare Star program that they implemented several years ago. When you know they're trying to to put a standardized measurement out there, but not everybody qualifies. And some of these independent pharmacies, especially in rural care, they may not even be uh, flowing along those lines or doing that. You know. It's going to come to a point, like Rana said, we want to be qualified to be able to deliver that care. And maybe there's something that we need to do to standardize that. But for God's sakes, we all graduate from pharmacy school. We all have the clinical background to do what's got to be done. And all we're asking for is a fair shake and being able to be reimbursed for that care. Because as you know, we can dispense prescriptions and lose money every time we do it. But the contract says you have to do it, you know, and I'm, I'm looking in the chat box too, and I'm reading some of these, these, uh, the, the notes that you're sending in, you know, like trying to open a tele, telepharmacy, but you can't do it unless you've been in business six months, for God's sakes, if you're in an underserved area, let them do it. As long as they are credentialed properly, let them do it. And it's, it's things like that. There's drivers, in the rural area that we want to, we want to, uh, you know, we want them to be qualified, but yet don't put barriers up to patient care. And that's exactly what's happening. And when you talk about these pharmacy deserts, even in the big towns, look what's happening with Walgreens and some of these chain plants, they're moving out because uh, they can't afford, to, because of theft and other things, they can't afford to keep their pharmacies open. And that is to the detriment of the people who can't go anywhere else and get their medication. And, you know, they've uh, changed the, what we've done is extended to the telehealth rules for another two years. And I'd like to make a lot of that permanent, especially for mental health, when it comes to what pharmacists can do there too. There's just a whole host of things I want to tackle. Some things are in the works, some things will have to start, but I think we'll get bipartisan support on everything. That's encouraging. And Go ahead. Dr. Van Nuys, I was going to say that question about quality is an important one. And to Congresswoman Harshbarger's point, We've got to expand, you know, payment for services, expanded pharmacist services. And that's exactly what, you know, the bill she referenced and introduced does. It requires Medicare to pay for test and treatment services provided by pharmacists. So we look at COVID, we look at what pharmacists did and how they stood up the country and helped save, you know, millions of patients by giving them COVID shots and helping them with their uh, rapid test or providing Paxlovid, for example. So we've got to expand these types of services 
And we've got to, you know, value a pharmacy for those services they're providing. The blood pressure checks they're doing, the cholesterol checks they're doing, the diabetes screenings they're doing. You know, we've got to look at that world and outcomes and when it comes to quality measures of pharmacies, not process measures. For years, the measures used to apply to pharmacies are based on process. Did a patient get 30 pills? Did they get 90 pills? And, and that's not even did they take them. That's just these uh, star ratings metrics dealing with adherence only show if you actually, you know, send it out your door. So we've got to move away from these measures and we've got to move away from process to more uh, outcomes based pharmacy measures. And there's a lot of work being done in the um, in the world, in the pharmacy world and uh, healthcare world to do that. That's encouraging. Um, uh, Dr. Katu, I want to get you into this conversation yeah. a little bit, too. Um, we've talked a lot about independent pharmacies and the pressures on independent pharmacies, but that, you know, chains are also part of this landscape. Are these pressures, are you seeing them differently um, manifesting on chains versus independents? Um, and what can be so, done? Yeah. Uh, differently, but at the same time, kind of similar pressures depending on the neighborhood. Right. But independents for sure are at greater risk of closing than chains. And I think their reasons for closing may be different. Um, you know, chains, I mean, just today in Chicago, you know, Walmart's closing four stores, right? The reason for them closing those stores is, and they had pharmacies, um, was underperformance, right? And what does that mean? For an independent pharmacy, it's like, hey, pay us. We'll stay open. And they have for decades up until, you know, the dynamics have changed in the market. But for chains, yeah, it might be a little harder because of the reimbursement models, but they have um, the power and the capital to at least ensure some equity. And I think going back to the question about quality, what's not really incorporated to date is pharmacy access equity and standards, right? So Medicare Part D has pharmacy access standards, but you know, I challenge anyone to tell me <laughs> about a plan where that doesn't meet that standard. It's just so easy to meet. It's not sensitive to disparities in pharmacy access. So I, I think chains and independents deal with, you know, pharmacy closures, um, but independents are affected more and their the reasons underlying them, oftentimes they don't really have control over uh, given the role of PBMs and pharmacy networks. And I'm thinking that that vertical integration question, you know, really impacts the chains more than the pharmacy, than the independent pharmacies. I don't know, Representative Harshbarger, if you have a point of view on that that you want to share. Absolutely. You know, I, I've been an independent pharmacy owner up until I, I came to Congress. And, you know, my husband's a pharmacist, my son, my daughter-in-law. It's not like we're not vested in this profession. And, you know, I've seen the vertical integration just kill independent pharmacies. And it's all about the reimbursement. It's a take it or leave it mentality. You can even your PSAOs who hold most of the contracts, you know, they try to negotiate the best contract for you, but you still have to independently get it with your big three. You have to go and independently, uh, you know, get a contract with Caremark or Express Scripts or Optum. And so, uh, I mean, and even when you ask, if you have audits, and the, these are other things, that's another way to take your money back, desk audits. And God forbid you get an on-site audit, which is uh, ridiculous, but the desk audits, every day they come through, numerous audits. And, you know, it's up to, it's up to their interpretation and they can change the rules. You know, I have patients come in and one day they're like, why didn't my copay go up? Nobody notify me. I said, well, dear, I, I don't know. This is what they're giving me as a point of sale. They won't even tell the, their own patients that your copays are changing. And maybe it's on the formulary one day and it's not on the other day. And that formulary structure, too, is a huge thing. And as far as reimbursement, basically, say you've got different generics and one generic NDC is on the formulary, but you cannot get that because it's not available and you have to substitute. They're not going to pay you for that. Or that's where the clawback comes in. You know, how, how are independents ever supposed to stay in business and it is totally due to vertical integration and it's not just the pharmacies we see it in healthcare physicians offices if you're an independent physician you are such an anomaly anymore you can't stay in business or they won't send you referrals it's 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 uh it's not a fair or level playing ground and uh, there's no um when you look at um equity in this we are being outplayed 10 to 1 when it comes to that. So we can't service the patients that we really want to service and the way we want to service them because our hands are tied behind our back. 
because we can't or we can't, you know, in a closed networks too, that's another PBM issue. Uh, even if you wanted to take somebody's insurance, you may not be allowed to enter that network. And so therefore, uh, you know, it'll, it'll go to one of these uh, big three, big six PBMs and mail orders and other things. You know, it's the, it's just not fair. And we want to level playing field. Let everybody do it the right way. But uh, it's going to deter young pharmacists from ever going out and opening a pharmacy. Why would they want to deal with all this? Just as I'm reading some of these comments, why would they even want to deal with it when when they it, it's it's futile in a lot of ways? But uh, we want to encourage them to do it. I did it, and uh, it's it's the best thing I ever did. But um, you know, I know there's questions out there with vertical integration, and we're here to answer those. That's why I'm in Congress. Okay, I'm ready to tackle that. I'm sure that some of our uh, audience are very uh, happy to hear that. Um, uh, one of the questions here is specifically about DIR fees. Um, and that DIR fees are supposed to be tied to quality. Um, and I don't know whether uh, Dr. Hauser, Representative Harshbarger, if you want to comment on the linkage between DIR fees and these measures of quality and whether that is another issue in this. Well, yeah. we'll let Rhonda start because she'd be more diplomatic than me when it comes <laughs> to DIR fees and what I think about them. Well, for the most part, I think anyone saying that DIR fees are tied to quality is a very uh, misguided statement. You know, a lot of times you're paying a percentage based off the, uh, you know, the cost of the uh, total cost of the drugs, you know, that you dispense that were submitted. So uh, let's let's don't joke. It's not it's not about quality. Uh, it can be wrapped up in a package and tied with a bow that says it's about quality. But uh, at the end of the day, it, you know, it's all about the bottom line and cost and uh, clawing back uh, increasing amounts of money from from small business pharmacies. Uh, it just doesn't it doesn't just happen to independents. Uh, these uh, 12, 13 billion dollar a year clawback numbers that we see are for all pharmacies chain and independent. It's a problem across the board. But um you know, it definitely at the end of the day has very little to do with quality. We're trying to get there. As I mentioned, we want to see uh, quality payments uh, for outcomes that we help, uh, you know, our patients achieve. Uh, it has to be, um, you know, has to be torn apart from the cost of the drug, though. When you try to put the cost of the drug along with a, a quality measure, it doesn't work. You have to look at the dispensing cost of a drug, getting the right drug to the right patient at the right time, separate from the quality that you're providing and helping them achieve an outcome. Um, it's very difficult when it's tied together like it is right now in Part D. Anything to add, Representative Harshberger? Well, the first time I learned about DIR fees is when the, one of the pharmacists that worked with me, uh, I was asking her about reconciliation, and she said, I don't know why they're taking all this money out. And I started looking. I'm like, what is it? It's like reading a cable bill. It, do you know everything that's on a cable bill? No. What the? No. And, and you still don't know. Even when you call the particular pharmacy benefit manager, they're not going to give you an explanation. They're not. And so to me, they're just like Ronna said, there's no reason. I, I don't even know why what the clawback is tied to. I don't know what the DIR fee is tied to. They can't really explain that to us. But I do know when she gives you uh, numbers in the billions, that's a problem. And so I think the FTC, like I said, these are things that we've told them to look at. We help them with questions on the front end. So if they can't get to answers, that tells me that someone's not so willing to come forward and, and give us the information we need. I, I noticed there's a comment in the chat here too, that if we do our best on quality, the best we could do is decrease our DIR fees to 9%. So that you know the 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 question how did we ever survive without the r fees <laughs> we did so much better without them so i got get rid of them yeah hmm. so um dr katu I, rana mentioned dr hauser mentioned um this idea of outcomes and and the tying quality measures to outcomes and stuff what do we know by the research of the impact of maybe pharmacy deserts or pharmacy closures on health outcomes in communities that are affected? We know it's not good. Um, we know when pharmacies close, you know, a lot of people stop taking their medications. There's also some work um, from another research team that uh, showed um, that when pharmacies close, especially in neighborhoods that lack, you know, have fewer pharmacies, there's also increased readmission, hospital readmissions, right? So whether it's non-adherence or hospital readmissions, those are all added costs um, to the healthcare system. 
And, you know, within that, it's also inequity. Um, so that there's, there's major implications in terms of health disparities, because where we see most of the closures happening, they're happening in areas that are already pharmacy deserts. So most people already have to travel further to get to their pharmacy. And then that's compounded when announcements like 200, 300 pharmacies are going to close in the next year. Um, or, you know, sometimes, you know, in a few, in a few days, uh, that gets worse. So we know disruptions in pharmacy access um, leads to worse health outcomes in general, um, and it affects communities of color, low-income populations, even in rural areas, um, as well as, you know, neighborhoods that really lack access. So pharmacy closing in a neighborhood that has more, you know, more pharmacies per square mile or per capita is different than a pharmacy closing um, in a neighborhood that really doesn't have another pharmacy within a mile or two miles. Um, so, you know, the impact varies depending on the neighborhood, but it does lead to worsening health disparities. Mm -hmm. A really interesting question in the, in the chat here from Elizabeth. Um, by passing a law requiring pharmacies to be owned by a licensed pharmacist, North Dakota has essentially done away with corporate chain pharmacies. Corporations that own pharmacies must be majority owned by licensed pharmacists. Would legislation like this be effective in other states to help pharmacies stay in business? I'm going to start with Representative Harsh Barger, um, but I also want to get Dr. Hauser's thoughts too. Well, I would love to see numbers on that. You know, I think it's a pharmacy for heaven's sakes. Why would, you know, you have to have a licensed pharmacist on staff to even dispense things. And uh, maybe that would help in some entities uh, because you have to understand your profession in order to do it properly. You know, if you've got somebody who isn't a licensed pharmacist running a pharmacy, and it happens all the time, especially when you're looking at integrated health systems and things, um, there's nothing like a pharmacist running the ship. It's like, a. do you want somebody besides a pilot, uh, a, you know, piloting the plane? Do you want somebody, uh, do you want, well, I better not start on physicians, but, you know, to me, you know, give me the numbers. Let's see what the productivity or what the outcomes, you know, I've said this in Congress, if they had outcomes with every committee or every department under every agency, Boy, wouldn't that just change the way uh, government works if you had to be responsible for specific outcomes. And so I'd love to see what they're doing uh, in the state and see how that compares to other states that uh, where pharmacists, uh, pharmacies that are not pharmacists own, um, what the outcomes are with, with what they do and what, they, what the bottom line is on uh, profit margins and uh, patients served and access to uh, the pharmacy. That'd be a good thing to look at. Dr. Hauser, thoughts? Sure, yeah, I think it gets back to something Congresswoman mentioned earlier, a level playing field. You know, what makes a pharmacy is the, the owner, the pharmacist in charge, their staff, you know, patients are drawn to certain, you know, healthcare providers, including pharmacies, because of the rapport they feel because of the location in their community, et cetera. There's multi, multiple reasons. But um, you know, our members wanna play on a level playing field and always have. So if a patient chooses to get their prescriptions at a grocer, that's their choice. If they choose to go to mail order, that's their choice. But it has to be a level playing field and there can't be this steering and these incentives that are just completely blocked out for independents to participate. That's where we really see the problems occurring. So um, you know, it, it could be one solution, but it's one of, it's one of many. Uh, we need to see uh, patients have more choice. And uh, unfortunately, we're seeing, you know, we saw that with TRICARE last year, very sad state of affairs where patients were basically were told by TRICARE, can't go to your regular pharmacy, going to have to go to a new one. It's yeah. just disruption, especially when the patients are more elderly, it causes more confusion. And at the end of the day, you know, our members are the ones that are left having to explain all this. And they're certainly not getting paid for that, uh, you know, insurance broker or insurance uh you know, role that they're playing. Um, it's a lot of time and effort to explain these changes to patients. But that is steering though too, Ronnie. You know, you can't have physician owned pharmacies because they they look at the steering uh for prescriptions. So it, it is it you're right. It's 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 something that I'm all about pharmacy, uh, pharmacists own pharmacies, but you know, looking at data and outcomes and make sure there's no steering. I don't know how you could uh keep from that. But it's a lot of investment groups, too, that are purchasing uh, these entities and investment groups. So, you know, we just need to look at that. Karen, I would also like to add with the North Dakota law. So what yeah. we found in 
in our research, interestingly enough, that there are fewer pharmacies actually closing in North Dakota. <laughs> um, which, so, you know, perhaps they're protected, but I think the problems like Rana was mentioning are still there, right? So if you have a state law that requires you to be a basically a non-chain, right, um, to open up a pharmacy, you know, it's only as good and effective if those pharmacies are able to fill people's prescriptions at low cost. Yeah. Um, and the extent to which that's happening, uh, I'm not sure. Thank you. Um, I, I am aware we have five minutes left before the end of our time, and I would like to end on a more pos on the most positive <laughs> note we can. There's still tons of great questions in the chat. Um, but I want to give you all an opportunity to speak to some of the um, pharmacy students who may be in the audience. We are here at a, at a pharmacy school. Um, so uh, I'll start with you, Representative Harshbarger, but Dr. Hauser, Dr. Katu, feel free to jump in as well. What would you tell aspiring pharmacy students about what it takes to be successful in establishing an independent community pharmacy practice, particularly in a rural or underserved area? Well, I'm your woman. I've done that. And let me tell you, it, you better be ready and willing to work. Just because your hours may be nine to six or nine to eight, that doesn't mean that's when it stops. I mean, you have to be available 24-7. And you have to have the nature to care for those patients and want to want to help them with their problems. I Every day I'd get to work, I hang my shingle out because I don't know what's coming through the door. That's what made it so exciting. You know, I call myself a problem solver. And uh I'm still doing that in Congress, but nothing replaces experience. And if you're doing rotations, if you're doing internships, externships, you go out and you learn as much as you can. Don't be your average person just wanting to get through school. You go out and you do difficult things. Get out of your comfort zone. Learn about things that interest you, but wholeheartedly. Uh, if, if you're going to start your own pharmacy, it's hard. So be prepared to work long hours, and uh, there's nothing nothing like it. I can tell you, I love my profession. That's why I'm in Congress to fight for my profession. And don't let anything stop you. Just be ready and willing to put your running shoes on, and and uh, you'll succeed. But we have to make it a level playing field, as Rhonda said, or you'll never succeed. So I'm working on that right now. Encourage. Yeah, I believe the future of pharmacy is bright. You know, I, I've been a practicing community pharmacist. There's nothing more rewarding than helping your patients at the end of the day and knowing you made a difference in their lives. So I think the future is bright. You know, we're making a lot of inroads with changing the pharmacy payment model. You know, there's active legislation in Congress uh, right now in D.C., both on the House and Senate side, that would require all Medicaid managed care programs to pay that cost plus rate that fee-for-service programs pay. So we're trying to get to a fairer model, a more transparent model. And uh, I truly believe we'll get there. That coupled with uh, increased payment for pharmacist services, I think the future is bright. People view pharmacists as very trustworthy. And uh, I, I don't think that's gonna stop. Um, I was at my alma mater last night at University of Texas in Austin and super impressed with the students there and uh, their career aspirations and all the hard work they're willing to put in for their profession. So I think our profession's bright and CPA is out there to help, uh, you know, uh, curious owners, uh, you know, learn all they can to get into the business. And we have tons of resources to help them. So I encourage anyone to get into the business. And then uh, if you're if you're in a pharmacy desert area or, or you know, want to uh, go towards a more rural area, all the better, because those patients need you desperately. Um, so, yeah. Thanks. Dima, Dr. Katu. Yeah, you know, I, I would encourage um, pharmacy students to do three things. One, visit different communities. Um, and you know, try to understand where patients live and where they work, and you know, what is their experience before they get a medication before they go to the pharmacy. That's one. Two, I think um, it's okay to practice retail. You know, it's you know, I think pharmacy schools, you know, have historically and even now, right, are encouraging clinical practice, and that's fine. Um, but I think a lot of the impact could be done in the communities and retail pharmacies, independents, or chains serve thousands and thousands of people. So you can really have an impact as a community pharmacist. So, and then I think last is, you know, do what you can, right? So if you're in a state like California and you own a pharmacy or you work at a chain or you own an independent and you're authorized to dispense or prescribe, you know, contraception or um, PrEP for HIV prevention, um, you know, do it you know, get the certification, do what you can to actually be on the top of your license, right? To try to go beyond your dispensing role. Um, 
And, you know, there has to be some policies in place, right, to reimburse pharmacies, pharmacists for those services. And some states have them, some states don't. Um, but for those states that do, you know, I would encourage new pharmacy owners, students um, to implement the policies that are intended to improve access. Thanks. So here's what I'm he what I heard is that it's it is it has been difficult. It had Dima's data shows how hard it has been. But if you listen to the voices on this call, there are some real active, energetic people fighting to make this better. And that that is sort of the optimistic, the nature of the future in this industry. And that um, we are so grateful for you all, all the hard work you do and all of the, all of the um, you know, the optimism that you bring to this. Um, we're grateful for you for joining us today. Thank you so much to the audience. There were, uh, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the terrific questions, but um, it's been a really interesting conversation. And um, again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for all you're doing. And um, the future is brighter. <laughs>